we just stalked Lionheart from that point on and turned for home and, and that was it. He just responded and ran very well and was able to win the Derby. It was almost unreal being there and thinking, you know, we're in this race with a chance. This horse is going to win the Kentucky Derby. That's our horse. And here is the first undefeated winner of the Kentucky Derby since Seattle Slough in 1977. Smarty Jones has done it. Suddenly, people were loving Smarty. His popularity extended far beyond the cloistered world of racing. He got mountains of fan mail from all over the country, especially from school children. He was publicized everywhere, from TV to newspapers and magazines, even gracing the cover of Sports Illustrated. The cover of Sports Illustrated is like a sacred place. When you've got a story like Smarty Jones, incredible long shot, coming out of nowhere, beautiful, handsome, wonderful people around him, and he catches the imagination of the country, it, it happens so fast that there's a moment where you just, you just know you have to do it. Whether he would get to the Triple Crown or not, I was not sure, but I just knew that, that we were in some moment and we hadn't put a horse on the cover in, I think, probably 25 years. And uh, here was Smarty Jones, this the perfect story, the perfect horse at the, at the right moment. Two weeks later, a record crowd of nearly 113,000 was witness to history at Pimlico Racecourse as Smarty Jones tried to move one step closer to becoming the 12th Triple Crown winner. There's the horse of the hour. The race started much like the Kentucky Derby, with jockey Mike Smith gunning five to one second choice Lionheart right to the front, with three to five favorite Smarty Jones stalking him a length back. It was almost a dead heat because all Stewart did was just give the horse an opportunity at the top of the stretch to show his best form and when he shook the reins at him at the 316th pole, which is the, right at the top of the stretch, it was as if after a mile the race was just starting. Smith kept Lionheart two or three paths off the rail, trying to avoid the deeper part of the track and pushing the favorite to a wider path around the turns. The strategy failed. Turning for home after a mile in 136.44, jockey Stuart Elliott pulled Smarty Jones in towards the rail and through the gaping hole. I seen the opportunity to take the inside. I figured I better, just in case somebody else came and made it close, I better take every, save every inch I could. The horse took off like he had just come out of the gate again, and that does not happen. Horses get tired. They go slower at the end than at the beginning. This horse was going faster in the Preakness at the end than he was at the beginning. He's pulling away to win impressively here. Rockheart 10, second on the inside. He's going to win by a colossal margin. Here is Smarty Jones. He wins the Preakness by a dozen lengths. He galloped home to an 11 and a half length victory, topping the winning margin of 10 lengths set by Survivor in the first running of the Preakness Stakes in 1873. He just ran a great race. Um, I thought we could win, but I didn't think that he would win by 11 lengths and as easily as he did. To win by that much in that kind of a time, that was just the biggest, biggest margin in Preakness history, and the time was off the charts. It was, uh, it was a performance that left a lot of us in awe. Smarty was quickly becoming one of the most popular horses in recent memory, capturing the hearts and minds of racing fans and non-racing fans alike. Some began comparing him to the great triple winners, like Secretariat and Seattle Slough. Slough was a little bit rangier. Uh, Smarty Jones was a solider built horse than Slough, I would say. But they both had a uh, terrific shoulder and uh, a beautiful way of going. Both of them had a beautiful way of going, and uh, they both had a burning desire to run. Well, Smarty just seemed to me as, as a horse that uh, appreciated people a little bit more if you had to separate the two horses and uh, Sluz was just he had that burning desire to run and he had a terrific work ethic and and he was really a workaholic and there was um, not a not a whole lot more in his life at that time the Belmont track is one and a half miles the largest in the United States and its stretch 
is a killer. If you're not in front by the stretch, it's a heck of a place to try to catch up. So the other horses will try not to let a favorite be out in front too far by the time they get to that tough last pull. According to the professional handicappers, Smarty had run the best Preakness ever. The legend was growing. The Triple Crown was only one race away. On Saturday, June 5th, 2004, Smarty Jones went into the gate at Belmont Park, hoping to make history. There was a record crowd at the Belmont, the biggest crowd they ever had, and the noise was intense. And when Smarty took the lead at the top of the stretch, the noise was like a thundering earthquake. I did not think Smarty Jones could lose. I just didn't think there was a horse in the race under any imaginable circumstance that could have any chance to beat him. Will he take his place in racing history? We'll see. They're off in the 136 Belmont. When the gate opened, 10 to 1 shot Purge went to the front with 7 to 1 shot Rock Hard 10 and 2 to 5 favorite Smarty Jones pressing him through a quarter in 24.33 and a half in 48.65. At this point, Purge dropped from contention and the favorite inherited the lead. Alex Solis on Rock Hard 10 and Jerry Bailey on Eddington really took their horses out of what they do best and ran early in the race as hard as they could just to make Smarty Jones run harder earlier than he really wanted to. And by uh, forcing him into incredibly quick fractions on the backstretch at Belmont Park, uh, that potentially could take a toll on Smarty Jones. Rock Hard 10 continued to threaten as Smarty Jones went six furlongs in 111.76, a mile in 135.44, and 10 furlongs in two minutes 52. Usually at this point in the race, he's, he's settled in and he's, you know, relaxed somewhat and this this time he wasn't he had horse coming on his outside and um, he just started to pick up the pace and you know if it was just going a mile and a quarter probably wouldn't have mattered but I knew we had a long way to go and I was a little concerned I said this isn't good 36 to 1 long shot Birdstone who settled back in seventh early on made his move four wide on the turn, came on strong, and battled with the favorite inside the 116th pole. With 50 yards to go, the stubborn Smarty Jones gave up the lead in the stretch for the first time in his career. Birdstone surges past, Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. He started to get leg weary for the first time in his life, and it's because of what happened earlier in the race, and Birdstone, who had not run a good race since October, picked that day to run a race that few thought he was capable of. And really, Smarty Jones Moore was beaten by what happened early in the race. I can hear a horse coming on the outside, which was Birdstone. You know, he finally just wore us down. But uh, Smarty Jones, he dug in and he gave me everything he had. He just, you know, he had nothing left to fight off the eventual winner. As soon as Birdstone hit the finish line, a length ahead of Smarty Jones, the cheers of the crowd dropped into the stunned silence of disbelief. At the end, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. You know that whenever you run a horse in, the, uh, in a triple crown race, um, and you're the favorite, you don't have to beat one horse or two horses. You're gonna to have to beat a combination. You're gonna to have to beat the speed, and then you're gonna to have to stay to outstay the stayers. And that's, you accept that going in. I felt Marty, Smarty win the race, I really did. And uh, I was surprised that he didn't, but uh, that's the Belmont. Smarty gave it all he had, but it wasn't to be. He'd always been a small horse racing to the maximum of his physical abilities against larger horses, always going faster than the field and putting out the extra effort to maintain his champion's edge. But now, Smarty Jones was raced out. After the Belmont, it had been the Chapman's and Service's intention to continue racing Smarty, but he had bruising in all four cannon bones and any further competition might threaten a complete breakdown. The timing of the retirement was 
terrible because it was right after the Belmont Stakes. So I can't say that he didn't have a significant injury because I've been told by people whose opinions I trust that he ultimately would not have been able to race again. But I just thought it could have been handled way better than it was. If the, the horse had problems and he wasn't going to be uh, as good a horse uh, coming back, uh, they made a very good decision. If it boiled down to uh, being his, his too valuable to race anymore, that's a, that's a business decision. And uh, those are hard decisions to make. None of us are happy about this retirement. Um, I think this horse had a lot more to prove. I mean, I, I think people think he had a lot more to prove. We think he proved a lot. Smarty's effect on the national consciousness was as broad as it was deep. In his relatively short career, the glow he created in the hearts of racing fans extended far beyond the track. It became part of a growing national legend, affecting Americans of every age and walk of life. He may have lost his final race, but even in defeat, Smarty's legend continued to grow. His rise to national fame was obviously good for the sport, and particularly good for his home state. In the last 15 years, thoroughbred racing had gone through a decline and a consolidation. Legendary farms disappeared, and many grand old racetracks went bust, while others declined in attendance. The betting picture changed from 85% of wagers at the racetrack to 85% being done off track. The betting parlors and the internet swallowed the lion's share of the action. Smarty Jones had a real effect on getting the expanded gaming at our racetrack legislation passed because Smarty reminded people that we were saving a sport in Pennsylvania. Without expanded gaming at the race tax, without the slot machines, we would have had no horse racing industry in five or 10 years. Pennsylvania racing was especially hard hit as the state was competing with gambling casinos and its neighbors, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, and West Virginia. Meanwhile, the opposition to organized gambling remained strong. One antidote has been alternative gaming, or slot machines, in the clubhouse. At first, only the small states with marginal racetracks tried this. When they turned into palaces, with purses rising so high, horses from major racetracks started shipping in. The resulting upturn in revenue to the smaller states was not lost on other state governments. There's a great chance that uh, there will be many more horse farms built here because the money for Pennsylvania breads will grow exponentially as the slot money starts getting into the system. All of a sudden, it will become a destination state for people that like horse racing. And I would think there's a lot of people, even as we speak, out there trying to search for land that they can get at a reasonable value now that may go up as, uh, as slot machines come online. Smarty Jones attracted so much positive attention to horse racing that top-level government officials began to change their minds. That momentum carried the day to get more slot machines okayed for Pennsylvania than anywhere in the U.S. except Nevada. Horse racing is for people who love horse racing. Um, and there are very many of them. But uh, when, when, you, when you have a horse like Smarty Jones, suddenly, Everybody's a racing fan, and, uh, and that's what's so exciting about it, to see people who, you know, don't usually care or don't pay attention, whatever, somehow suddenly lit up with the possibility of, of a horse like that, you know, coming out of nowhere and, and doing something magical. Here was a horse who stood for the people and the people's dreams and the people's values, even as they were going through extremely difficult times. I got letters from kids all over the country about Thank you for fixing Smarty's bump and, you know, that they wanted to be veterinarians and they were just so excited about the story. So I think anyone, whether you were small or big, you know, could uh, define with some part of this story. I think there was a, there was something that this horse generated that maybe no horse in memory did. And I think maybe it was because the times he ran in, I mean, in the middle of a war, uh, a rancorous election, I think he gave people hope. I think they're seeing that here's this Pennsylvania bred from these people that were just small time players, a trainer that nobody had heard of, a jockey that nobody had heard of, 
coming that close to winning the Triple Crown. And again, anybody that understands horse racing knows he deserved to win it. I think Smarty Jones represents hope, so therefore I think he remains in people's consciousness for as long as the sport is around. I, I think the public embraced him. I think the story had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, the blue collar workers from Philadelphia, you know, that, that, that have this little horse that came from Philadelphia Park that couldn't possibly be that good. And, and he was. I think Smarty Jones is gonna be on the end of, of people's tongues for a lot of years to come. Our country and, and our state, first of all, loves underdogs. And Smarty was the quintessential underdog. Uh, he wasn't a purebred horse uh, from the hills of Kentucky in a fancy stable. He was trained and, uh, and reared at Philadelphia Park. It's been 30 years since Secretariat, just about. And uh, we haven't had a triple crown in a long time. I really don't know if you're gonna see one as good as Smarty again soon. You'll see really very good horses every year, but something as good as Smarty, I don't know. I mean, he's really, in some ways, the best there ever was.